Appearing initially in the 1985 catalog as the 1200 HD at nearly $3,000, it was last seen just a year later in the 1986 catalog as both the 1200 HD, just under $2,000, and the floppy only 1200 at around $1,500. I was giddy with excitement as I awaited its arrival. What a surprise! There was no mention of the original box at purchase time. And how about all the original packing material too? Over 40 discs as a bonus. The original keyboard in its original box. The main unit and its packing foam. And some guides and reference volumes. At last it's time for a look inside. The front, back, underside showing the speaker grill, and the FCC compliance sticker. The 25-3000, which is the hard drive version, was approved in 1984, and the 25-3001 the floppy only version was approved in 1985. Removing the cover reveals a date stamped on the underside, February two question marks 1985. Here is the naked 1200. What's this? Imagine a puzzled look on my face. It's a hard drive upside down. Well, okay then. Here is the video card, which took some digging to identify. It's a dual display graphics adapter, which, by the way, is the same as the ATI graphics solution. The earlier motherboards, identified by five ISA slots, required an add-in memory board to reach 640K. The later motherboards, with seven slots, provided for 640K on board. Check out this date. Either this was a late production system or had a ROM upgrade. Here is the onboard floppy controller header. Somehow, by accident or on purpose, the even and odd pins are reversed top to bottom. This would connect all signals coming and going to ground, effectively disabling any drive on the cable. Ask me how I, uh, cough cough, found out. Look closely at the original ribbon cable, which is just laying there, and you'll see that Tandy cut the number one wire off about an inch back and shifted the connector over one space. Now the ribbon cable connections have been flipped top to bottom to match the board header. You can ponder that one. Side of the power supply. The hard drive is revealed once the blank plate is removed. It's the good old Seagate ST225 21 megabyte 5 and a quarter half height drive. Due to being stored in humid conditions sometime in its life, corrosion has formed in a few less protected spots. The two tandem drives were mounted together so as to be handled as one full height drive. Once I had the floppy cable fiasco behind me, a three and a half inch high density drive, which works as a double density drive, a borrowed 8-bit MFN controller and an 8-bit VGA card was hooked up for a test run. Surprisingly, everything, including the hard drive, worked. Loading up my favorite PC poker arounder reveals the 1200's most intimate secrets. So it's true, Tandon is somehow behind the production of the 1200. Tandy didn't even bother changing the BIOS text string. Wanting to return the hard drive controller to its original system, I dug up this controller. I believe it may have come from an IBM PCXT. 
It has IBM silk screened on the back and matches the Zbeck controller pictures. The Zbeck slash IBM controller refused to operate with the existing format, so since I was going to low level format it to get the combo to work, I thought I'd try different sector interleaving. Look that one up if you don't know what it is. With an interleave of 6, max throughput was 85k. At an interleave of 5, max throughput inched up to 95k. But at an interleave of 4, max throughput dropped dramatically to 52k. Uh, don't pay any attention to the interleave measured by the program. It always says 1 or 2. Here is a system comparison. How about a 13 inch long modem to round out the system? Eh, maybe later. 